on this Friday night. These are not hoax devices. Under arrest, the man police say mailed bombs to the opponents of the U.S. president. Why, it's very clear he's a Donald Trump supporter. We we're trying to light the fire. Family members of two high-profile murder victims push for answers. What they're offering in exchange for information and what Toronto police say in response. To be clear, we don't think there is a systemic problem. Canadian telcos are called to account after a CBC News investigation. What your service providers told the CRTC. This is The National. Full of intolerance, emboldened by hateful rhetoric, the details are emerging tonight about the man accused of mailing bombs to prominent Democratic figures in the United States. He is a registered Republican and a big fan of the U.S. president. Yeah, we just took him into custody. The suspect arrested in Florida this morning is Cesar Sayoc. He's been charged with five felony counts. That includes things like illegal mailing of explosives and threatening a former president. If convicted, he'd face up to 48 years in prison, but the danger for the public may not be over just yet. Today's arrest doesn't mean we're all out of the woods. There may be other packages in transit now. Just today, more suspicious packages were intercepted while en route to three more opponents of the U.S. president, making it a total of 14 prominent Democrats targeted so far by the bomb maker. So who is Caesar Sayoc? Lindsay Duncombe takes a closer look. By many accounts, Cesar Sayoc was angry, lost, and determined, it seems, to do harm. Though we're still analyzing the devices in our laboratory, these are not hoax devices. Sayoc was arrested near an auto parts store where he had reportedly purchased flammable chemicals just last week. Officials tracked Sayoc through a fingerprint found on a package addressed to Democratic Congresswoman Maxine Waters. DNA evidence on other mailings also points to him. Sayoc, an amateur bodybuilder and former stripper, has a long criminal history, including arrests for drugs, fraud and theft. In 2002, he pleaded guilty to a bomb threat charge after threatening to blow up a power company. His former boss at a Florida restaurant said he was a racist. She is gay. But more than once he told me that if he had complete autonomy, I would burn in hell with all the blacks and Jews and Hispanics and everybody else. Sayoc had been living in this van, its windows papered with pro-Trump stickers. A Twitter account, which appears to belong to Sayoc, features threats against many of the Democrats targeted, including Joe Biden calling him a piece of slime trash. Hug your wife, it says. It also appears to show Sayoc at a Trump rally. Sayoc attended Trump's rally in Melbourne, Florida last year. His sign? CNN sucks. Asked if he was aware his image was all over the suspect's van, the president answered, I did not. I did not see my face on the van. I don't know. I heard he was a uh, person that preferred me over others, but I did not see that. Before today's arrest, Trump appeared to support a conspiracy theory that Democratic supporters were behind the pipe bombs, tweeting, Republicans are doing so well in early voting, now this bomb stuff happens and the momentum greatly slows. At his rally tonight, Trump called for an end to the politics of personal destruction, then blamed the media. The media has a major role to play, whether they want to or not. The crowd ate it up, chanting CNN sucks, the same slogan from Sayoc's sign. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. So you just heard briefly there from the owner of the restaurant where Sayoc worked. Here's a bit more from her now. She said that because of his vehicle, he wasn't allowed to make deliveries during the day. I hired him to drive at night. I couldn't have him driving in the daytime. I had him driving at night. Uh, he parked the van around the corner. I never got any complaints from any of the customers. If I did, he would have been fired. As far as an employee, he was on time. He was cordial. He was articulate. I never had any problems with him. Um, there was no theft. Uh, my customers liked him, uh, but it was just his political views that scared me. Um, uh, basically, um, he was a model employee. 
Okay, so all that talk about the pro-Trump stickers on Sayox van. Well, let's take a look at some of those in more detail. And keep in mind, the ones we're going to show you just come from one section of the passenger side. The van itself is covered in them. The stickers seem to say two things, that Sayok worshipped President Trump and had contempt for liberal politicians as well as the media, CNN in particular. In one image, Trump rides a tank into battle beside a bald eagle that's firing a machine gun. To the left, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama and filmmaker Michael Moore, all with gun sights on them. Another is titled, I Have a Dream, and appears to show liberals running as if they're being shot at. And this one seems pulled right from the 2016 presidential campaign, a swamp populated with a who's who of prominent Trump critics apparently sinking into the slime. So clearly a lot going on in Sayok's mind, some of it confusing, a lot of it extremely hostile, but what does it tell us? For some insight on that, I'm joined by Brian Levin, the director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at California State University. Brian, thanks for helping us out. It, it really feels like a time of heightened political fury and violence, uh, not just the pipe bombs, but of course, that shooting at the Republican baseball practice. But, but does your research actually bear those feelings out? Yes, it's a rising tide, but sometimes we have these overwhelming waves. Let me give you an example. November 2016 was the worst month for hate crime in 14 years, and the day after the election, there was a bomb plot to blow up a Muslim-populated uh, apartment complex, and that was the worst day for hate crime since 2003. So we've been seeing this go up in waves, then kind of go down a little bit, but the tide is rising, and among this most diversified threat matrix we've seen in decades, the far right here in the United States is the most ascendant. Okay, so what makes it hard for law enforcement to get ahead of this? That is a great question. And what we saw was this rising tide where groups were involved. And we saw that Unite the Right rally. Since then, we've seen fragmentation of both the organizations and their leadership, which means that a lot of these loose cherries which would, who would just be content to go to a rally or spout on the Internet might actually become operational. So these loners represent the biggest uh, problem for law enforcement because it's, it's hard to investigate a trail of one. Okay, Brian Levin, thanks very much. Thank you. And let's take a look at what else we're working on tonight. Surrogate mothers cannot be paid for giving birth, but what they can be paid for isn't quite so straightforward. We'll look at why that could soon change. And we've been telling you about some of the misleading tactics Canada's telecom companies have been using to sell their products. Well, today, Bell and Rogers had to explain themselves to the CRTC. First, though, the family of murdered billionaires, Barry and Honey Sherman, say they are frustrated, fed up, and taking matters into their own hands. They are offering a $10 million reward for information about the case. The Shermans were found dead in their Toronto mansion nearly a year ago. And as Ron Charles tells us all this time later, no suspects, no arrests. The lawyer for the Sherman family says they're offering the $10 million reward out of frustration at the apparent lack of progress in solving the murders last December of Barry and Honey Sherman. Also to light the fire under the Toronto Police Service and to uh, try to ensure that those investigative steps which either have not yet been completed, not to have been taken by this time, are completed. In the early days after the murders, the family of the billionaire couple hired a team of retired police detectives and a former Ontario chief coroner to privately investigate the case. Our parents never left anyone behind. They were taken from us. The Sherman's four adult children have heaped criticism on the Toronto police force, accusing detectives of initially treating the deaths as a murder-suicide and bungling the subsequent double murder investigation. The family's private team says police failed to check all possible entrances to the house, collect all possible evidence, and take fingerprints from people who had routine access to the house. We know there were other people in the crime scene, uh, such as housekeepers and cleaners. We've spoken to these people and some of them have not been fingerprinted. This investigation has been done um, to a very high level of professionalism and high level of expertise. 
Toronto's police chief defended his investigators and welcomed the reward, at least in theory. We know that historically that rewards don't necessarily help when it comes to concluding cases, but this is an opportunity that may offer great assistance. It certainly will put the investigation back in light again. The Sherman family has even set up a staffed tip line, hoping that someone somewhere will be able to shed some light on what happened in this house 10 months ago. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. And we also have the CBC's John Lancaster joining us right now because, John, you've been tracking this murder investigation for months now, and we learned more today about the moment the Shermans were found. Yeah, one of the people inside that house was a, a realtor, and he was there to show the house to a couple of clients. Now, he doesn't want to be his name out there because the killers haven't been caught, so we agreed to, to protect him in right. that regard. He describes the tour was almost over with his clients. They head down to the basement, look through this glass door leading into the pool area, and there are what appear to be two bodies. Uh, he doesn't believe, or he refuses to believe that, that they could be real bodies. He described it to me as uh, thinking it was some kind of leftover Halloween prank from six weeks earlier when it was Halloween. Wow. He said to me, he thought, uh, what kind of rich people are, they? Are, are these people that would leave something like this as a, some kind of sick joke? He refused to believe what he saw, and so did his clients, was real. Given there were other staff on the house working, no one expected to, to see dead bodies in the house. Right. So they have this jarring experience. They leave thinking that it couldn't possibly have been bodies. And yet, I mean, after the fact, we know that they were witnesses to this gruesome scene. I mean, so what's, what happens next? And what's even stranger about that, Andrew, is that two days later, he's on the internet reading the news, and he sees the Shermans have been murdered in the house he was at, in the location he was at, and he, and he realizes what they had seen was real. He says it wasn't about it until about a week or two later, though, that police actually reached out to him to get a statement from him, even though he'd been there when the bodies were discovered. Mm. He said he went in there and talked to police, he handed over the shoes that they wanted, that he'd wore there, and he said police have since followed up asking for his fingerprints, but haven't actually followed through yet. Okay, John Lancaster, lots to follow up on. Thanks so much. Okay. Let's turn to another ongoing Canadian investigation. This country's two biggest telecommunications companies are defending the way they and their employees do business. Both Bell and Rogers spoke today at public hearings looking into misleading sales practices. And as Catherine Cullen tells us, it all started with a CBC News investigation. One, one complaint is one complaint too many. There was this certainly is, is some a, contrition from Rogers and Bell at these hearings. The thing is, this is about much, much more than one complaint. I said to him, how many other senior citizens are you guys doing this to? It's just been a non-stop a nightmare for me. The five-day hearings were prompted by what CBC's Go Public uncovered about misleading and aggressive sales tactics. So this fight is an ongoing fight with me forever. I was just in shock because I was guaranteed a price of $100 a month for the next, you know, 24 months. Other telecoms have been quick to blame the biggest companies. Uh, there, there is a problem with certain providers, the largest providers. But while Bell and Rogers expressed regret for some situations, they also defended the way they do business. In some instances, we had absolutely failed those customers uh, badly. In other instances, there were, you could see the, the misunderstanding that occurred. And in some instances, we actually do not think that it, it, it actually was a well-founded uh, complaint. Yes, we have, you know, 50,000 employees. And, you know, from time to time, there is an employee uh, that, you know, that, you know, we'll need to deal with on that particular issue. Both talked about the new measures they were taking to help out customers, but said there is not a larger problem. We don't think there is a systemic problem. If we had that rampant an issue, you know, customers would not, you know, want to come to Bell. The companies have pushed back against the idea of a new industry sales code of conduct, saying there's no shortage of rules right now. But some consumer groups have argued that the companies are in denial and need new rules and oversight so that aggressive sales practices will stop. The CRTC will weigh in with its report by the end of February. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, now to a story that is so incredibly personal to so many in this country. Canadian couples seeking help to have a baby aren't allowed to hire a surrogate mother under the law. But 
What they are allowed to pay for isn't so clear. So today, Health Canada is laying down some ground rules. Christine Birak asks the question, what impact will those changes have? It's a horse. A horse. It's a dog. Two kids can be a handful. Lindsay Jarrett has five. Her family is complete, but she's hoping to have one more. Okay. That's the bird. For a couple she's never met. If my body is able, then why not give someone that gift? It is. It's a big snake. Legally, it has to be a gift. But until now, it wasn't clear what expenses relating to that gift could be paid for by the couple. If the cost crossed a line and started looking like payments, someone could go to jail. Now that there's a proposed list of covered expenses, Jared is relieved. The proposed regulations under the Assisted Human Reproduction Act cover surrogate mothers along with those donating eggs and sperm. Covered expenses may include travel, including transportation, parking, meals and accommodation, child care, legal services and counselling, and any related insurance. Some bioethicists are applauding Health Canada for finally proposing these rules. I think they stay true to the principle of the legislation, which is the non-commercialization of human reproduction. Fertility lawyer Sherry Levitin hoped the legislation would move towards allowing for some payments. What's distressing to me is that there's still a throwback. The law is meant to protect donors from coercion and prevent people from selling reproductive abilities. Levitin feels there is room for responsible progress. But she isn't taking issue with the proposed regulations. It's really helpful to be able to tell them exactly what they can reimburse for and what they can't reimburse for. But others are being far more critical. Liberal MP Anthony Housefather has been pushing to end the ban on paid surrogacy. He says these clarifications do not go far enough, insisting it's time to take a harder look at the laws, which he calls ineffective and outdated. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Some other stories we're following tonight on The National. The fiancé of journalist Jamal Khashoggi has revealed she has declined an invitation from Donald Trump to go to the United States. In her first television interview, Hatta Cengiz says she thought the invitation was insincere and the president's motivation was to win sympathy with the public. Khashoggi was killed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul three weeks ago. He was organizing paperwork for the couple's planned marriage. Today, Turkey said it wants to extradite 18 Saudis arrested in Riyadh in connection with the killing. Really touch. Oh my God. Oh. And it was Canadian Robert Wickens who was the driver involved in that terrifying crash back in August. He has just now revealed the extent of his injuries. The 29-year-old from Guelph, Ontario, is paralyzed from the waist down. He posted this video of his recovery, saying he has small movements in his legs. He's far away from walking on his own. Okay, still ahead tonight on The National. Concrete is just about everywhere you look, but making it actually produces a lot of pollution. I'll take you inside a Canadian company that's trying to fix that. And a little later, the new season of Making a Murderer is here. Is the true crime genre more entertainment than investigation? The pop panel weighs in. First, though, the fight for equal rights in horror movies. Whoa, it's only women being murdered in this movie? No, 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 we gotta change this. We have to make sure everybody gets murdered. I pray every night that he would escape. What the hell did you do that for? So I can kill him. Well, there she is. That's Jamie Lee Curtis in the newest installment of the horror franchise, Halloween. The role she first played 40 years ago is still slaying at the box office, raking in $100 million on its opening weekend. Not all women in horror have had the same survival skills as Curtis's character. The genre has often been accused of stereotyping women as sex objects or victims. But as Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, as more women take to the director's chair, that's changing. It's horror trivia night at Rue Morgue magazine. Who directed Satan's Rhapsody in 1917? This group of women loves a scary movie, especially one with a strong female lead. There's a movie that a lot of people hate, 
but I love it. It's Alien vs. Predator because oh, yes. Sanaa Lathan mm-hmm. is the final girl in that movie, and I love her because she's my girl crush. I'm going to say mine now because <laughs> otherwise somebody else is going to take it, and it's Ripley from Alien. Yes. <laughs> They're not alone. According to industry analysts, box office pro, slightly more women than men actually watch horror. I think women have a very intimate relationship with fear and seeing it depicted on screen can be very cathartic and comforting. But for all the women watching horror, there have been very few women making it until recently. People see people like me and Jen talking about horror movies and they're like... Canadian twins Jen and Sylvia Soska are at the forefront. Whoa, it's only women being murdered in this movie? No, 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 we gotta change this. We have to make sure everybody gets murdered. Now they're remaking Rabid, an early film of their idol David Cronenberg about a woman turned into a vampire by an experimental surgery. The basic storyline is the same, but it's told from a distinctly female perspective. You know when you're walking down the street just as a woman minding your business and some guy starts following you and saying things to pick you up and then when you ignore him because perhaps he's being rude and vulgar then he says he's going to kill murder and rape you etc etc that scene is in our movie and that person gets what's coming to them and it's so enjoyable what are you doing here Horror films made by men tend to feature female nudity. In the female-made horror, male bodies are more often on display. It's just a book. Movies like The Babadook tackle taboo themes like women's ambivalence about motherhood. Have you ever heard of body modification? And Soska Sister's own American Mary features a lot of female rage. Stop, Please. please. One thing that hasn't changed These films are still scary, often gory, and don't always portray women as morally pure. Can we go now? We're not through yet. Mary Heron, veteran Canadian director of American Psycho, gave the Soska sisters notes on their rough cut. Well, I think horror is still a kind of last frontier, you know, and and for women. And I think people would prefer if you, you know, a woman director that you do um, films about women who are either heroic or or victims, you know, so, you know, straightforwardly sympathetic. But I've always been fascinated by people who are a little more complicated and culpable. Hi. Okay, so the right hey. to fright as these women continue to fight for equality in front of the camera and behind the scenes. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And up next on The National, the fix for a major source of pollution could actually be the pollution itself. You'll see how concrete is being made almost out of thin air. First, though, Ian and the pop panel. Making a Murder is back on Netflix with a new season, but can true crime deliver the full truth? The pop panel goes in depth next. Making a Murderer is back, which means many of us are about to turn into criminal justice lawyers. For those of you who haven't binge watched the show, it's just the latest in a whole slew of highly addictive true crime shows. True crime is like porn in the sense that it it just flows into whatever medium is out there, high, low, whatever. Shows like Making a Murderer and Serial, The Jinx, The Keepers, they are addictive, but they also get people talking about the criminal justice system. I'm Katie Underwood, freelance writer and editor. I'm Donovan Bennett, host and staff writer for Sportsnet. I'm Stephen Marsh, a random Toronto freelancer. But these shows are entertainment, uh, not just information, and it's a really dangerous part of the world right now that there's a huge number of people who just can't tell the difference. As great as it is to get people engaged in the flaws of our criminal justice system, we do have to take these shows with a grain of salt. Shouldn't our crimes be tried in impartial institutions rather than the court of public opinion? So it turns out our entire pop panel has seen Making a Murderer, knows this genre of kind of long-form crime reporting. And Stephen, let's begin with you. What is it that you like about this this genre? Well, I think what I like is a bit weird. I mean, what I like is the human portrait and the portrait of the towns. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I love this genre. I consume, I binge watch all of them. And I, I just find it like, you know, the, the true crime stuff, the did he, who done it, did he do it or did he not do it? I mean, that's, that keeps you watching, but they're, they're really intimate portraits of, of 
uh, you know, communities, and, and that's what I love about them. So the thing is, the appeal of these programs is unquestionable. I guess the question is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? that so many people are so obsessed by these crime stories? I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think, you know, having the public be exposed to what goes on in the justice system can only really illuminate what does and make people more aware. Um, I think it makes sense having watched the series and, you know, seeing kind of the the perversions of justice that I saw as a legal expert because I've watched it. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think I would be concerned as a matter of the public, a, a member of the, pam uh, sorry, a member of the public watching it. But I also think that, um, it makes a lot of sense that people would be uh, be interested in it. Now, you have a slightly different view about all the attention and whether that's a good or bad thing. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not good for my internet consumption. The, yeah. the, the bills have been <laughs> the high. Yeah. But, but uh, listen, I love it. I, I, I actually am guilty how much I love it. It is a bit of rubbernecking for me. But I, I do wonder, though, when you talk about seeing the criminal justice system, how much of it are we seeing? Yeah, for sure. Like, it, it, it's highlights. It's not actual <laughs> real depiction. Law is painstakingly long. There's a lot of detail. We're not getting all that detail because it's entertainment. There are editorial choices that need to be made. But I think we all think we're village lawyers and we understand these sure. cases based <laughs> off of binging in one or two nights. I'm just starting to lose my patience with all shows that, you know, create this entertainment information Confusion, this distortion is really unhealthy. And you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who watch a television show and then feel perfectly confident that they know what happened. I mean, that, that's how poor their consumption habits are of media. But who's the onus on though? Because I don't think Netflix mm -hmm. is trying to pretend that they're the New York Times or the Washington Post mm -hmm. or the CBC. Yeah. I, I, they're I, I, an entertainment property, right? And I think the onus should be on us to take everything with a grain of salt to watch and then research, and then ask more questions. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we should do that with our news, never mind our entertainment. I never yeah. Ideally. Let me yeah, give you ideally. Well, sure. <laughs> well, let me give you an alternative view, though, because I, I've heard from too many lawyers here in Canada and, and judges who I've spoken to who are negative about even news coverage of what happens in the courts because they say it's so imperfect. You guys only cover certain kinds of cases. And my view is that, that you know, some good coverage is better than none. And when you have some good coverage, then that means you're opening the door to coverage that's not so good. So uh, to your point, I think we have to hope that, that the public understands that making a murderer is not reality, but maybe, Stephen, it's a version of reality. And maybe it's closer to reality than, than let's say, law and order. Look, you're a journalist, right? You come at the, but it, it's different when you come at it from the point of view of entertainment. If you are, if you, essentially, if you're using entertainment to provide a lens on reality, you're providing reality television. And we know what the consequences are when reality television swallows the whole world because we're living in it, right? Like that's what Washington is right now. Um, and that's, that just seems super dangerous to me, even when the motives are good. Even when, the, even when the motives are unquestionably good. Now, well, what come to you in just, I'll come to you in one sec, but I should point out with one of the interesting things about Making a Murderer is the second season has now dropped, and they are making references in that second season to all the attention they got in the first season by various journalists. Take a look. Making a murderer. Making a murderer. Making a murderer. Making 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 making, making a murderer. Okay, so yeah. maybe maybe there's a little conflict. <laughs> Why do we see that clip? Well, uh, <laughs> the enunciation of making was outstanding. Yeah, so, so Donovan that? lives in the world of sports, and so let's watch that again with a little bit of slow motion. <laughs> making a murderer. Making a murderer. Making a murderer. Making. making. <laughs> I did not know I was going to be in it, and uh, I was thrilled. I was sitting there on Saturday uh, in my condo and uh, and tweeting to friends, oh, I'm on making a murder. <laughs> so, um, putting that aside, uh, there are one of the things, there's almost a new genre of these multi-episode podcasts or, uh, or crime shows. Uh, which is your favorite? Oh man, uh, I really enjoyed making a murderer. I would recommend people not binge watch the entire thing. <laughs> All eight to ten, Which or you however did with my, the first season. I did on a Sunday. It was probably the most depressing Sunday of my entire <laughs> life. Um, yeah, I think uh, I would definitely recommend it. I also followed Serial which mm -hmm. was great. And Serial is also kind of the thing that kicked off the true yep. crime podcast true. fad. Yep. So I really loved it. I think Sarah Koenig did a, a great job, or as good a job as she, she possibly could have given uh, that it was one person telling the story. And in both of those cases, Serial and Making a Murder, it did uh, motivate people, not just to get interested, but to demand more accountability. And sometimes it went over the line, as we saw at the beginning of the uh, first episode of the second season of Making a Murder, 
the one I'm in. Um, <laughs> they, they talk Wait. about how there were death threats uh, against the, uh, the prosecutors who I think did a lousy job based on what I saw, but obviously it didn't justify death threats. Before we move on to our next topic, of this genre, what do you recommend? Oh, The Jinx. That would be my top one. Which was on HBO. Which was on HBO. I mean, I just think that's incredible. Yeah. But Making a Murder is also excellent. Serial. I mean, how can you not recommend Serial? It's yeah. so unbelievable. First season is Serial. First season is Serial. so much. I didn't actually listen yeah. to the second season. Uh, which is true of uh, a lot of people. They loved right. the first one, didn't even listen to the second one. Yeah, I mean, this is like asking me to choose between my children, right? <laughs> you got The Keepers, you got The Jinx, you got The Staircase, you got Mommy, Dead, and Dearest. Um, you watch I, a lot of TV. I do, yeah. As I said, I'm ashamed about how much of this genre that I consume. Um, I may need an intervention. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's change topics now. And uh, we are going to talk about a record in pop music that has been held since 1964 by one of the most innovative and, and arguably most creative groups of all time, the Beatles, broken Ooh. by Drake <laughs> because of this song. <laughs> So with that song, Drake has the most top 10 singles on Billboard's Hot 100 in a single year, the most since the Beatles in 1964. We're going to put the list up of some of those hits by both the Beatles and Drake to give people a sense of uh, how generations have changed. Let's talk about, I mean, this is, you think about Elton John, uh, Prince, Michael Jackson, Justin Bieber, Madonna. None of those people came close to this Beatles record. It was a guy from this town, from Toronto, What's the appeal of Drake? I mean, I think Drake's always had an eye to mass appeal, and he's always had an eye to being as relatable as possible. So even from his earliest videos, you know, he shot one in a shopper's drug mart. He talked about loving his mom, wearing fairly geriatric sweaters. So, like, that's going to say a specific center of the marketplace. But even looking towards his more recent videos, if you look at Hotline Bling, it's like someone engineered that to be cut up into GIFs. Yeah. And there's also a huge dance craze around the song In My Feelings. So I think he's just known how to play both sides of the market really well and been cognizant of that for as long as he's been out. Yeah, it's really interesting. The appeal of Drake? Well, he's a, he's a meme artist, really, more than, a, more than a musician. Like, he makes memes. He makes huge social media events that transcend music and then lift his music to this incredible place. I mean, there was one point where he had 24 songs in the Billboard 100. So mm -hmm. that, was, that means he's a quarter of popular music for a moment. It's totally absurd. Um, but it is also a difference in the way these things are tracked, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's so streaming now, for streaming, example. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's, it, it, it's, and don't get me wrong, it's incredibly impressive nonetheless, but like it's a little, it's sort of like the difference between a piece going viral on Facebook and everyone going out and buying a novel. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the Beatles. Yeah. It's, it's just a different. Yeah. That is a great analogy, Donovan. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a cultural curator, right? Yeah. He's a he's a tastemaker, and to your point about the social media, when an album comes out, you know that a bunch of captions are in, on Instagram are going to be his lyrics. But but even more so than that, I think he, to use a sports term, has figured out the analytics in that you know when fifteen hundred streams equal an album sale, mm -hmm. I want to get on as many Spotify playlists as possible. And based on being from this place in Canada, very multicultural, his music incorporates not just hip hop and R&B, but grime from the UK, Afro pop. We, we saw a Latin influence, dance hall. He's able to use the melting pot that is this country to influence his music, which gets him on a lot of playlists got some a lot of streams. Wow, I feel like I've learned more about his appeal from the three of you than, uh, than I understood certainly before uh, we did this panel. Uh, 20 seconds each to give me your pick. That's something that people watching should be thinking about uh, consuming. Yeah, well, we've already heard I consume too much television. I'll give you something else. BuzzFeed has a show with Netflix. It's called Follow This. Uh, it takes a look at their newsroom and how they cover stories about the Internet specifically and the craze around the Internet. That's a really good, tight, kind of 12 to 18-minute watch. Perfect. New Halloween movie. Totally amazing. Uh, you grandma imagine. revenge fantasy. There's not nearly enough of this. A what? Uh, yeah, it's a grandmother what? revenge fantasy. You have I to don't see want to it. go any It's brilliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I would say the show is sponsored by Netflix now, but we're our own network. Uh, I really enjoyed Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. It's a new Netflix series. It's kind of a foodie travelogue. And it does away with a lot of the food snobbery that's sort of endemic in that genre. And it's just a lot of very nice stylized shots of cheeses. All right. They might so what's not to like? Other than uh, episode one of season two of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Making a Murderer. Uh, my wife, every time I talk to her on the phone, she's in Vancouver. I'm in Toronto. She says, The Rookie with Nathan Fillion. 
Oh, yeah. She loves that show. She says it's worth watching. I'm not sure what the appeal is. Is it um, different but than I'm, Rookie Blue? Uh, apparently much different. So, oh, wow. uh, you know, I defer to her. It's a good idea. Uh, not to be CBC PR, but should you not be pumping your own true crime series coming out? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That's a podcast we have uh, coming up uh, in, uh, in November, but we have more time to talk about that. But thank you, Donovan. Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking, huh? Okay, up next on The National, the cement industry is one of the world's big carbon dioxide emitting industries, but a Canadian company is trying to change that by using the pollution itself to fix the problem. So the CO2 from that tank outside comes in here? Yeah, so it comes in through a pipe, directly into the mixer, mixes with the fresh concrete, uh, reacts right away. Okay, thanks. There is no decision. Oh. oh, my God. Tonight on the National, a French Court of Appeal has again delayed a ruling in the case of Canadian Hassan Diab. He was supposed to learn today whether the decision to release him from prison last January would be upheld. Instead, the court wants to take another look at handwriting evidence that prosecutors claim links Diab to the 1980 bombing of a Paris synagogue. This evidence has previously been discredited. Diab has never formally been charged and has always maintained his innocence. I want to begin with two words. I'm sorry. And that apology this week from Megyn Kelly was not enough to save her show. NBC has cancelled Megyn Kelly today. The host, who is paid $23 million a year U.S., by the way, sparked outrage earlier this week when she defended the use of blackface during a segment about Halloween costumes. And Brazil's media has dubbed this man the Trump of the tropics, and he's tipped to win the country's presidency. Jair Bolsonaro is a former army captain who has won major support by promising to jail corrupt lawmakers and make it easier for the police to shoot drug traffickers. But his misogynist and racist comments also angered many. Voters go to the polls on Sunday. Well, few things have transformed human civilization like concrete. By far, the most abundant man-made material on the planet. It is strong, durable, fire-resistant, and doesn't require a whole lot of maintenance. But there's a huge environmental cost in creating concrete. Staggering amounts of carbon dioxide, one of the main greenhouse gases in this world. So, a Canadian company has devised a fix to make concrete almost out of thin air, in a way. Imagine that same gas, carbon dioxide, being used to make strong and safe concrete blocks. Here's a closer look. The modern world is literally built out of concrete. It's everywhere. Concrete is one of the most widely used building materials in the world. You can look at a building, you can look at a curb, you can look at a bridge, you can look at sculptures, you can, there's, it's just endless. Everything uses concrete. But the concrete industry has a problem. Making it pollutes a lot. 7% of the world's CO2 emissions link back to a single ingredient in concrete. So if we could reduce that uh, by any amount, it would be a success. If you can get that number down, that's a game changer. Yes, absolutely. So here's how you make concrete. You need three things, water, random bits like sand and gravel, and cement, which is the glue that binds it all together. But making a kilogram of cement releases about half a kilogram of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So the team at a company called Carbon Cure has devised a clever way of turning CO2 into something useful. Okay, so Josh, what do we have in this tank? In this tank, we have liquid carbon dioxide. Right now, they're shipping it in direct from industrial polluters, long before it ever reaches Earth's atmosphere. It's bottled up and prepped for the mixer. So this is it. Yeah, this is the mixer. So the CO2 from that tank outside comes in here. Yeah, so it comes in through a pipe, directly into the mixer, mixes with the fresh concrete, uh, reacts right away. Yes, you heard right. They're mixing CO2 back into the concrete, sequestering it forever. It uh, starts reacting with the cement immediately, 
and is permanently um, encapsulated in the concrete. So even if the concrete breaks, say a building is demolished, the CO2 never escapes because it hardens. It becomes a solid. It's even strong enough to take the place of some of that expensive polluting cement. And using less cement saves money and pays for the carbon dioxide. It actually ends up being cost control. Yes, you're getting the exact same quality concrete, only greener. It is on a larger scale this idea starts to show real promise because trapping concrete block by block is one thing, but by the hundreds or thousands of blocks, this plant can produce tens of thousands in a single day. Its entire product line, every single block it makes, is injected with carbon dioxide. And there are a hundred plants just like this one across Canada and the US using the very same technology. But even that is just a drop in the bucket. If there are skeptics in the concrete industry, it's because of how sensitive the whole process is. I mean, just consider this. These concrete blocks are fresh out of the mold. The mixture has to be just right. They're laser measured to make sure they're right to spec. And if anything is off, these blocks come right off and they're junk. This is actually the, the area where we drilled cores out to send off to the lab for testing. Luke Johnson works for Tridel, a major developer based in Toronto. I needed to know exactly what it is, what it does. Does it affect my timelines? Does it affect my budget? And most importantly, one of our core values, does it affect our quality? On this downtown site, 14 stories will ride on the strength of his concrete. The walls, your conventional run-of-the-mill stuff. But the big test, the floor right under our feet. And how did it do? It, it performed well, the order went well. Structurally, um, durability. Structurally, all the testing, everything met the uh, specified criteria. And not far away, a project with carbon cure concrete in mind from the very start. This is going to be a hospital in Vaughan, Ontario. This particular product project is using in excess of 500,000 individual blocks. It's an example of how a nod to the environment can pay off big. The promise of a green building was key to getting this project off the ground. And how much carbon dioxide are you able to trap? So this particular project is just under 14,000 pounds of CO2, essentially that's captured in there. So to put that into more relatable terms, it'd be the equivalent of about 146 tree seedlings grown over about 10 years. That's right. trapped in that building yeah, yeah. once it's done. Right. Across all of its projects, Carbon Cure estimates it's kept millions of kilograms of CO2 from escaping into the atmosphere. The challenge now is getting the word out and convincing companies it can pay to go green. Doing that would go a long way in turning one of the world's most prolific greenhouse gases into simple building blocks. Oh, it's like the definition of a fix. So it's really interesting. I, I'd imagine it means that companies will be able to, you know, pull back on how much cement they end up using. Is it your sense that they're already pulling back? Right. So, so that, that's a really good question. And I had the same one. But the short answer, are they using less cement? No, not yet. Both companies you just saw are still unsure. They want to see how this stuff performs over a really long period of time, like years, before they start reducing cement bit by bit, which, you know, it's fair, considering you don't want to roll the dice with a 20-story building. So the concrete they're using now is stronger because it's been reinforced with carbon dioxide, but it's nowhere near as green as it could be. Uh, not yet, anyway. Okay, untapped potential. We'll be right back with the moment. It's an honor usually reserved for U.S. presidents being laid to rest in Washington's National Cathedral. But today, it was Matthew Shepard's turn 20 years after he was murdered for being gay. The 21-year-old university student was robbed, beaten, and tied to a fence in Wyoming. His brutal killing became a rallying cry for LGBTQ rights. And for years, his parents kept his ashes in their home until now. And that is our moment. It's so important that we now have a home for Matt, a home that others can visit, 
a home that is safe from haters, a home that he loved dearly. Matt was blind, just like this beautiful house of worship. He did not see skin color. He did not see religion. He did not see sexual orientation. All he saw was a chance to have another friend. So I have three things I want to say to Matt. <laughs> Gently rest in this place. You are safe now. Oh yeah, and Matt, welcome home. I'm in. You know, it's amazing. This is the funeral Matthew Shepard didn't get to have. 20 years ago, it, there were so many homophobic protesters at the funeral. His dad had to wear a bulletproof vest. Uh, I remember this so clearly, but I heard something today I'd never heard before, that the first police officer on the scene found a deer lying beside Matthew's body, and that when she approached, the deer locked eyes with her before it walked away, and it has haunted her ever since. Wow. And you know, this, this theme of, of being home kept coming up. And, and that place, the Washington Nath National Cathedral, is, is very much thought of as the spiritual home of the nation. And so hopefully today did provide some closure to a nation that went numb all those years ago. That is the National for this October 26th. Have a good night. Good night.